Yes. Um, yes. So. Yes. 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 So I would suggest yesterday. Yes. So I would suggest because yesterday we had some problems with the sound. Do you all hear me well? Okay. Because otherwise, otherwise, our technicians, they suggest if you come closer to us and in this spectrum, you may have an experience of hearing, mostly metaphysical. Yes. Yesterday, Eileen Miles, she was barking every time the door was opening and closing. Woo, woo! She was going like this. I don't know if I have to keep this tradition. There is one thing that I usually am very, I very feel uncomfortable, and I always feel uncomfortable about this distance. See, you are there, and me, I'm here. I always am I'm uncomfortable with this. But since the power of the word is that without touching you, I'm inside you, then I think we are all fine. By the way, can I call you Nikita? Why Sorry? What about William? William was yesterday. Uh, this is because, because it will make things much easier for me. Don't you have the feeling that if I call you Nikita, we already know each other? Good. Dear Nikita, thank you for coming. Bonsoir. You're welcome. So, as you can see, we are in an uh, amphitheater. See, it's beautiful. We are in an amphitheater. Now, I think you already guessed the trick. That amphitheater is already a metaphor. Right? Just the word amphitheater is already a metaphor. Now, there is also a little particle about the fact of being in an amphitheater. That little in, in the phrase. It looks so harmless, it looks so small. In. That in, like in your bag, that in, it's also a metaphor. See, we go in and we come out, right? We go in and we come out. But we don't go in only in rooms and forests, right? We also go in tunnels of depression. And we come out from depression, right? Now, why when we come out from a tunnel of depression, at the end of the tunnel there must be always light. How come that we think that everything is an extension of our body? How come that we think that everything is an extension of our body? We say, when we, are, when we feel good, we say, I feel high. 
And when we feel bad, we say, I feel low. Hmm? Because maybe when we are tired and we, we, when we feel bad, we lay down and we go to sleep. And when we feel ready and strong, we stand up. Is it maybe, this is maybe why heavens are up in the sky and the underworld is down on the ground? Is it maybe because of this? See, some people are scared about metaphors. Very scared. They prefer names. But names, actually, for me, are even worse. Names are even worse than metaphors sometimes. But you see, metaphors are very democratic because they're always talking of someone else, about something else. Names, instead, they need a whole reference. If I say, he wants to talk, maybe as a, maybe he's not a greasy, but yeah, I think he's not a greasy. But if I say, for example, Edip, Edip, you, you have all the story, the mother, the father, the whole thing, huh? even when he got blind. If I say Hamlet, you have the whole thing in an instant, isn't it? If I say the two names at the same time, you have two stories and a headache. <laughs> right? Fuck shit, I'll say another one. But names, of course they embody stories and they compress information, but are shareable only if you belong to a certain system of culture where actually Hamlet, Edip, and Jesus mean something to you. Yes. But see, the names belong to the same process of metaphorization. That's why I think that metaphors are more important. Not metaphors, but the way we metaphorize things, that process. It's not just the process of association, of course. Metaphors can be the way that we extend our body into the world, space and time. Can be the, the way that our brain thinks. They are cultural, yes, but they are also embodied. The associations are always about the fact that we are a body and not about that we have a body. There is something I'm very, very sensitive about the fact of having something and being something. They say, we have this word, we have to save it. We don't have it. Which, which make us more responsible, even more. See, for example, I was thinking that if metaphors are embodied, they belong to the body, they belong to the culture. So what, for example, would be the metaphor of a bad day for a fish? A bad day for a fish would be a day of fresh air. A day of fresh air. That would be a bad day for a fish. <laughs> Sometimes you need an artist to see invisible things, but it's OK. Imagine, for example, if something like a cloud could make a metaphor. See? For a cloud, time would never be money. Never. Never. For a cloud, time would be always the weather. And maybe now you may think that future is always ahead because we walk forward and the past is always on our back. But in Mesopotamia, 5,000 years ago, the Mesopotamian scribes, they were working backwards because they knew everything about the future through their calculation, see? But nothing about the past because they were making copies of copies of copies of copies. 
Yes. But now, if you think that fortunately there are some creature in this world that doesn't use metaphors, then you're wrong, more or less. Do you know these beautiful orchids? They're called bees orchids. They make a flower that looks like a bee on top of a flower that it's, try, it's trying to sneak in. I mean a real bee on top of a flower with hairs and wings and all, even the perfume of the bee. That flower is using a metonymy as an attractor. There are also at the Jardin des Plantes, there are also orchids, and they call them goat orchids. They don't look like a goat, it would be too big, right? On top of a flower also it would be like a goat. But they smell like goats. And they use this smell as an attractor. Come to me, baby. See, what I'm, saying, I'm trying to say is it also that metaphors, maybe, have been developed or exist for surviving. Now I just end because I talk too much otherwise, but see, there are not, are not metaphors that are problematics, but allegories. Allegories are complex systems that once are crystallized, they always say the same thing, more or less. Unless society changes, unless the sculptures get white, unless the ancient gods are forgotten. Hmm? And then once all of this happens, you may go into the Louvre and you may say, why love us to be a little boy with a little penis and a little bow and two little wings as a chicken? Between poets, metaphors have been also a subject of harsh debates, as much as rhymes. Can we do without? Borgia said no, that we cannot, that every word we say, even this one, is a living or a dead metaphor. Something that wants to say something else. One day I even heard in a conference someone says that metaphors are fascists. Metaphors aren't fascists. Actually, he was making a metaphor of a metaphor of a metaphor. It was very much into a labyrinth. I know that all these things that I say, they are not clear to you. They are not clear even to me. That's why tonight I invited some beautiful people and amazing people. Because I had some questions and then I thought, Maybe those questions are not just my questions. See? So I invited those people so together we can make the experience of the answer. So tonight I invited Gregor Robleski, which is a, a poet. I'd like to say that to you that you are a poet. And I'd like to say to you about you that you are one of those poets that I may find in the queue in the supermarket. And suddenly I'm in the queue in the supermarket and somehow I resonate inside you. I like to think about you as one of those poets that walk in the streets and I ring the bell, get off! But at that time I resonate about you, inside you. I'm not saying that you judge me or something. It just resonates. We'll see it tomorrow maybe with Van Sien, the story about how we resonate inside poets and poets. Um, yes, and I invited, of course, uh, Joao de Pina Cabral because uh, I think that it's very, it's very risky to be an anthropologist today, but I hope that everyone can become an anthropologist one day. I would like to become an anthropologist one day. Uh, because it's very nice when you put a lot of struggle and a lot of efforts to understand the other and at the same time you, you understand yourself. And I also invited uh, Siri Jadan because he has this, this beautiful capacity, this amazing capacity of turning things inside out as you may do with your socks in the morning. 
discovering all the secret parts, the heat and the darkness. His poems and, and novels are satiric, hilarious, and dramatically serious as well. So, I think that now Siri is going to give his presentation, and then uh, Joao, and then Gregor, and this is the first part. Then we have a second part, which is going to be a conversation. The chairs are waiting there. And then there, there is the third part, which is champagne. <laughs> I don't know which part you would prefer the most. Please enjoy. You're welcome. Добрий вечір. Я попрошу Данила допомогти мені сказати кілька слів. Власне, що, що я розумію під метафорою? What I understand as being a metaphor. Для мене метафора це спосіб ускладнення. For me, uh, the metaphor is a way to uh, get uh, more complicated. It's a trial to uh, form a distance. We uh, build uh, some uh, constructions, uh, things and uh, objects. Ми займаємося порівняннями, ми займаємося пізнаванням, ми займаємося називанням речей. We take care of uh, naming things, uh, uh, of uh, make uh, knowledge. Це зрештою робить поезію поезією. This is what makes poetry poetry. Але не лише це. But not only that. Поезія може бути різною, і метафора, в принципі, не є незамінним чинником в поезії. The poetry can be diverse, and uh, the metaphor is not uh, uh, an irreplaceable element of it. Uh, when uh, Alex uh, spoke about uh, metaphors, I uh, had the idea to propose uh, poems to you where uh, metaphors are precisely absent. Uh, I, uh, in the last times, I uh, wrote and uh, keep writing uh, very much about uh, what is happening in Ukraine. In Ukraine, you have a war now. And for me, as a writer, there is the question how you should one write about the war. Наскільки доцільними при описах війни є застосування літературних художніх засобів? And how much uh, literature and uh, artistic means uh, are uh, relevant to uh, describe the war? Наскільки вони є доречними, наскільки є доречними метафори, наскільки є доречними якісь літературні ілюзії? How uh, relevant are uh, metaphors, literature, literary illusions uh, when describing the war? Коли ти говориш when you speak about uh, things like this, blood, and uh, disappearance uh, of uh, complete uh, cities. In addition that uh, the war is by itself a big uh, metaphor, uh, completely self-sufficient. And uh, this is why I uh, wrote a cycle uh, which is called Why I am uh, absent from uh, the social network. This is uh, the story of people who uh, by force or uh, one way or another uh, get, got caught in this uh, circle of uh, war. From uh, different uh, sides, uh, from different uh, uh, locations, and uh, with uh, different statuses. And uh, I tried to describe those people uh, with a but uh, after I wrote those uh, poems, I understand uh, today that it was a total fiasco. Because 
because uh, all of our uh, uh, thoughts and uh, the way we speak, uh, they are full of illusions and uh, of descriptions of how we think. Ну, классно, я вам зараз почитаю шість віршів, чотири будуть в перекладах англійською, відкриті на французькій. I will read uh, six poems to you, and uh, four uh, will have uh, their translation uh, in English uh, projected on the screen, and uh, two of them in French. Добре, перший, я вже перший. Голка. Антон, 32 роки. В статусі було вказано, що живе з батьками. Православ, хоча до церкви не ходив. Закінчив університет, іноземна англійська. Працював татуювальником, мав свій почерк, якщо можна так сказати. Через його умілі руки і гостру голку пройшов на один натовп місцевих. Коли все це почалося, багато говорив про політику та історію. Почав ходити на мітинги, пересварився з друзями. Друзі ображались, клієнти зникали, боялись, не розуміли. Виїжджали з міста. Найкраще відчуваєш людину, торкаючись її голку. Голка жала, голка шиває. Під теплим металом таке податливе полотно жіночої шкіри. Такий цупкий світлий презент шкіри чоловіків. Протинаєш чиюсь оболону. Випускаєш із тіла оксамитові краплі крові. Б'єш, б'єш, вибиваєш щанглині крила на покірній поверхні світу. Б'єш. Б'єш татуювальник, адже ми покликані наповнювати цей світ сенсом, наповнювати його кольорами. Б'єш татуювальник цю обшивку, від якої душі й хвороби, те, чим ми живемо, заради чого вмираємо. Хтось розповів, що його підстрелили на бок посту, вранці, зі зброєю в руках, якось випадково. Ніхто нічого не встиг зрозуміти. Поховали в спільній могилі, їх там усіх так і ховали. Особисті речі передали батькам. Статус так ніхто і не прав. Прийде час, яка навіть наволоч обов'язково буде писати про це героїчні вірші. Прийде час, яка навіть наволоч скаже, що про це взагалі не треба писати. Це можна? Все. Мародер. Погана біографія. З таких біографій роблять ранкові новини. Старий його замерз у грудні, в порожньому трамваї. У мами проблеми з цукром. Незакінчене технічне. Два роки на обліку. Випалене йодом горло. Розірване арматурою вуха. Про що ти мріяв усі ці роки? Чого хотів? Все, чого він хотів, лежало в найближчому торгівельному центрі. Зламати його було, ніби зламати печатки на папських грамотах. Я ніколи, писав він, не мав такої кількості грошей, аби купити все, що мені хочеться. Завжди відкладав на кращі часи. Лише тепер зрозумів, що кращих часів не буде. Ти теж народився тут. Ти знаєш, як воно все. Скажи слідом за мною. Життя жорстоке і несправедливе. Життя безнадійне і коротке. Життя безрадісне і підле. Той, хто нічого не має, нічого й не матиме. Той, кому немає чого втрачати, нічого не втратить. Тут давно ніхто не чекає на кращі часи. Тиху, мовчазну смерть тут ніхто не відрізняє від решти жінок. Добре серце, хворі легені, живеш із нею, тому що любиш. Помираєш, тому що живеш із нею. Спасибі, що пишеш, дякую він. Спасибі, що пишеш. Немає за що відповідати. Справді. Немає за що. Не за що відповідати, а встигай точно. Добре, так. Сектор. Андрій і Павло. Адвентисти. Студенти. 
Тато підприємець, підтримував громаду. Вони звикли ставитись до церкви, як до частини свого життя. Бували там щодня, допомагали робити ремонт, викладали фото в мережі, дякували за підтримку. Їх і за мирних часів вважали сектантами. А коли все це почалося, просто влаштували на них полювання. Хтось виїхав, хтось сховався, а їх обох схопили. Тримали у підвалі, примушували ховати загибу, копати могилу. Вони хотіли відкупитись, боялися, плакали. Їх перевели до іншої ями. Потім просто забули про них, ніби їх і не існувало. Сиділи в чорному підвалі, слухали темряву, спочатку молились, потім кинули, соромилися одне одного. Віру і втрачаєш тоді, коли випадає можливість за неї померти, а ти цією можливістю не встигаєш скористатися. Нащо віра тому, хто бачив, як усе виглядає насправді? Нащо вірити в те, що не має для тебе жодного значення? Ніхто не говорить, що було зі святими, в яких на тілі відкривалися стигми. Що було з цими стигмами? Вони самі собою закривалися, як троянди на двечі. Чи довго кровоточили, гноїлись, боліли під бентами? Чоловіки зі сліпими від темряви очима приходили до госпіталю на прив'язку. Стискали зуби, коли сестра відривала їм від рани засохлі бенти і свіжа кров проступала на темній шкірі. Просили знеболювального, бодай якогось. Але не існує жодного знеболювального від того, що в них болить. Не існує. Ошуковик. Довго її розшукував. Номер вона змінила, з міста втекла, соціальними мережами не користувалася. Через знайомих знайти не вдалося. Через церкву теж. А потім сама написала. Про справи, про переїзд, про нові обставини, про звикання. Розповіла про брата. Думаю, заради цього і писала. Щоб розповісти про брата. Про його смерть. Мабуть, зверталась із цим не лише до мене. Принаймні, не до мене першого. Надто вже спокійно писали. Їх накрили, писали, всіх разом, одним залом. Потім наші повернулися. Хотіли забрати загиблих. Вірніше, те, що від них лишилося. Найтяжче було з ногами. В кожного має бути по дві ноги. Вони їх так і складали. Щоб у кожного було по дві ноги, бажано одного розуму. Брат займався музикою, мав хорошу гітару. У нього її постійно позичали. Ось що з нею тепер робити, питала вона. Я брала, пробувала грати, порізала пальці з незвичкою. Дуже боліло, досі не заживаю. Чеченка. Юра. Вже за 40. Історик за освітою. Соціальний працівник. Сидить у мережі. Відслідковує рвані кроки історії. Пише блог від імені Чеченка. Вигадав собі таку снайперку. Живе тепер її життя. Пише про її віру. Пише про її сумнів. Пише про її вразливість. Робить зарубки на її прикладі. Це ось ворог отець. Це ось ворог син. Це дух святий. Теж ворог. Теж вартий, аби про нього згадали в загальному розстрільному списку, за яким замовляє молитви невидима снайперка. Світ – поштовий мішок, зашитий колючим дротом. Прорвеш – Полізуть із дитячих сорочок та рушників чорні жаби вижі. Нам ніколи не дізнатися, хто.
хто стояв у розпалених натовпах, готових рвати ніжну тканину чужого тіла. Нам ніколи не дізнатись, кого в цих натовпах не було. Вести тебе нічними дорогами, між трави та вугілля. Робити нечутними твої кроки в легких професійних кросівках. Виводити до джерел обхід натоптаних кров'ячих стежок. Лишати для тебе на ранок хліб, загорнутий у вороже знамену. Зранку він перечитує написане. Іноді щось додає, іноді править. Голиться, ріже шкіру старими станками. Але крові немає, зовсім немає. І смерті теж немає. Псих. Міста шкода, говорить він, знищать його, як Содом і Гомор додає. Його брат лежить в інтернаті для психічно хворих. Кілька днів тому інтернат захопили. Поставили міномети на подвір'ї. Він провідує брата. Сидять на лавочці під яблуневим гіллям. Зовні подібні. Обоє в спортивних костюмах. Обоє коротко стрижені. Лише в одного в руках мобільний телефон. Хоча зв'язку в місті все одно немає. Автоматники не звертають на них уваги. Вони теж на них не звертають. В дитинстві він брата соромився. Ніколи не говорили про нього. Ніколи не брали з собою. Знаєш, як це, коли в твоїй родині псих? Тато нормальний. Мама нормальна. Ти теж нормальний. Але є один псих. Справжній псих. Псих. У твоїй родині. А значить, і на тебе теж падає підозра. Коли підріс, просто перестав звертати на брата увагу. Ніби його й не було. Так буває, коли йдеш вулицею і помічаєш боковим зором щось неприємне. Щось таке, що викликає страх і відразу. Наприклад, розірвану тканину, тварину. Але знаєш, якщо туди не дивитись, то ніби нічого й немає. Ніби все гаразд. Ось так і тепер. Сидять разом, мовчать. І ніхто на них не звертає увагу. Ніби їх і немає. Хіба мало їх тут лишилось? Тих, хто так і не вибрався. Тих, хто лежить на узбіччі, ніби розірвана тварина. Керівництво інтернату давно розбіглось. За хворими доглядають кілька прибиральниць. Старі жінки, які пропрацювали тут ціле своє життя. Шестеро чи семеро. Не так і мало для міста Львів. When um, Alex invited me to come and speak to you, I, uh, I really thought, what, what am I going to speak about? Because I'm normally, uh, I, I speak often to audiences, but normally I do the boring thing. I give them well-argued papers with footnotes and things like that. And that's not what I'm going to do to you today. Um, he asked me to speak to you about metaphor and I thought I'd give you some general thoughts about what I think about metaphor, and then I would read you an example of what you can do with a metaphor, and I would discuss that a little bit with you, a poem. Um, I, um, I don't like so much to speak about metaphors because they separate metaphor from the rest of our thoughts. And indeed, the truth is, we only have that. 
we, we cannot say, oh, this is a metaphor, and this is not a metaphor. We can't really say that, because our mode of thinking is essentially associational. And that's what we have. That's how we think. And we have been told for a very long time, for a very long time, that truth th thinking is what logic does. Is that it's the stuff of, of mathematics. And what the other people do normally when you know, when you get home at night, that's not really thinking, that's just messy stuff. That's superstition, that's magic, that's... But then, you know, sometime in the middle of the 20th century, we started rethinking that. And people like um, Wittgenstein came and, came and told us, you know, to think is like coming up to you. To think is like coming up to a person. So that notion that thinking was something that was done through formal ways and that we were somehow thinking less because we weren't being mathematic, it's just suddenly succumbed. And we came to understand that yes, there is mathematics, yes, there is logics, but those things are not how humans think. They are, as it were, a technical exercise that humans can also practice under certain, certain controlled circumstances. Because what humans do, and what they do when they stop reading their academic paper, it's not logic, as described by Aristotle. It's logic, as described by Lévi-Strauss. It's association, and that has to do with metaphor, has to do with metonymy, has to do with analogy, more generally speaking. And I like to think of imagination. I like to talk of imagination. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the limits of imagination. Why is it that when you, you, you're not really free to imagine everything that you want? It's not that you're not free. You don't have a kind of a, a, a police in your head. So if you want to go that way, you can go that way. But the truth is that you don't. It's a bit like a city. You have a map of a city, and there is you know, all these streets. But if you observe the city from a helicopter over a period of time, you understand that most people don't use the whole city. They go through the same sort of paths all the time. And nobody's telling them that they can only go through those paths. But those are really the more comfortable routes. And everybody, more or less, soon enough, finds the comfortable routes. And most people land up going through the same way. And that's why there are uh, uh, traffic problems, right? And it's the same thing with thinking. It's the same thing with imagining. There are no limits. There is no, no demigod that sat outside and said, you may not think that way. You cannot imagine that way. Now, that doesn't exist. But the fact is, we fall into the ruts. And in the end, we are limited. We'll end up thinking in certain circumscribed sort of ways. And that really is the, uh, uh, what I wanted to come to talk to you about, the way we are called by the other within us. Um, Thomas Mann has a marvelous essay um, and about, precisely about these things. And comes a moment in which he says, you know, even madmen, don't become deranged haphazardly. Even madmen create traditions. There are traditions of mad people. And you go to Rome, and they get mad in a certain way. You go to China, and they get mad in another way. But they're getting mad. You know, they should be out of the box. They should be thinking madly, haphazardly but they're not thinking haphazardly, and they're following traditions. And that is really the essence, I think, of, uh, of what I want to tell you about, is that contrary to what we think normally, we don't have one concept, and then another concept, and then another concept. There's this philosopher, Donald Davidson, who says, and he says very rightly, there is no such thing as a single belief. You know, you think you can have one belief, and then you have another belief, like, I believe Gregor exists, 
then I believe the amphitheater exists. And these are separate beliefs, but they're not separate. And what I find is that the belief system, I can only have one belief because there is two beliefs next to it to support it. And that's the logic of imagination. And the, uh, the pro problem is, because we are human beings, when we get into imagination, we, how should I put it, we become ourselves because we get into imagination. We don't first be ourselves and then think. It's because we think that we are ourselves and we think because we are speaking to other people. And that's why mad people fall into madness in traditions. And that's why we're not really free. We, f we are free to free associate, but in the end we're going to free associate in the way everybody else does, more or less. Because we do not first exist and then think, we first think and then exist. And that is really the trick. And I wanted to speak to you then a little bit about the, the, the limits of imagination. And the limits of imagination, they not, as I say, limits from the outside. They're limits from within. Imagination is something that you do because you create images. But we have this idea that you have pictures in your head. There is no such thing. Neurophysiologists have shown you, uh, have shown us that there is no such thing as pictures in your head. Imagining is really reenacting experiences that you had before. You don't have a film in your head. You have memories of having seen that film. And, it's the same, and you have images, of course, of pictures, because we are all prone to give greater emphasis to, to visuality. But in fact, you, know, you have images of touch. You have images of sound. And these things conjoin into a, a process of association that where each thing depends on the others. It's what this same philosopher calls the holism of the mental. The fact that you, your mental phenomena are really whole, they're, they're integral. And then imagination is about something else, and it looks like it's something different, but in the end it isn't. Again, it's associated, it's transformation. If you're imagining, you are transforming. And in our very everyday life, we assume, we say, are ah, you imagining things? It's because you're going somewhere else. If you were where you were before, you weren't imagining. If you always had the same thought, you weren't imagining. You're imagining because you're not having the same thought. And why aren't you having the same thought? Because you're interacting with the world. Because time doesn't stop. Because, you, because your thoughts are not pictures in your head. Your thoughts are experiences of being in the world, are embodied experiences of moving in the world. And finally, you have concept formation. And that's a really interesting one, because I think, I think, um, I think of a chair, okay? But I'm a Portuguese person who was raised, as it happens, in Africa. So I have experiences from my early childhood of chairs, right? And of what a chair is, and who occupies a chair, and why is it that African people didn't use chairs, and, and I have childhood experiences of that. So if I start thinking of chairs, all this, all this kind of holism comes to my head. But I bet you, to you, it doesn't come in the same way. So each one of us has our own life, has our own experience. So for me, a chair is a thing. For you, a chair is another. So we don't communicate. So you'll never understand what I mean by a chair. And this is true. You will never understand completely what I mean by a chair. The problem is that I, 10 minutes past, will also not understand fully what 10 minutes before I thought would have been a chair. So there is no essence here. There is no fixed things. There is only approximation. I approximate what your chair is. Your chair approximates what my chair is. And we kind of approximate each other. And it's like Wittgenstein says, speaking is like coming up to somebody. And that's what I do. I have charity. You say, Yun Cheza. And I think, oh, she means Ekevera. 
because my first language happens to be Portuguese. All right? I translate. But if you say a chair, and I think, oh, she means a chair, but I, I'm also translating in the same way. But because I'm kind, and because you're kind, we kind of approximate, and in the end we know that, you know, more or less, a chair. We kind of get there. And that's, that is the secret. But the fascinating thing is that, you know, I'm telling you this, so you're thinking that, oh, this man has a solipsistic theory of truth. He has a theory that everybody knows what a chair is, and the other people know what a chair is, and they, they don't meet. Yes, it's true. I have a theory that they don't meet, but I don't have a theory that I meet with myself. You see, ultimately, that is the difference. So it is all about small steps and nothing about big steps. It's all about approximating, approximating myself as much as approximating you. So what is the third aspect of imagination? It's concept formation, right? Now think about a concept. <clears throat> Sky, chair, man, woman, car. You know, I'm, I have these concepts. Did I invent them? But, you know, you know that I was born in 1954. I, I should have lied to you, but it happens that I was born in 1954. So, there were chairs before me. So when I discovered myself in the world, and I discovered myself because I entered into speech with other human beings. And they started gesticulating to me and I started understanding that if they said like that, it was that way. And if they said like that, it was that way. And then I started understanding words like chair, but the word like chair already existed. So I entered into the concept <coughs> that was historically already there. But it's my own concept. Nobody shares it with me. So there is this kind of quandary, and that's really what's beautiful about imagination. And I wanted to tell you a little bit, but I will be short, because I then want to move on to the second part of what I want to say, which is the, the limits of imagination are of different kinds. And there is at least three types of differences. And it's, you know, anthropologists for a very long time, they tried to theorize these things from the outside onto the practice, like you do with logic. You start by P and not P, and then you kind of work towards the man that doesn't really distinguish between what is a, uh, an egg and what is a fried egg, and it doesn't really know how to make that distinction. And so it might be P and not P, but because you know that the true thinking is P or not P, right? But anthropologists these days are doing it the other way around. And we're doing it the other way around in the sense that we're looking to see how people actually move about in the world. How do they actually fall into the same ruts, into the same uh, uh, pathways? And that way, we start seeing emerging other forms of universalism. It's a universalism that is not universal, because nobody does. It's a factorial analysis. It's a statistical analysis. You don't say, everybody does this in this way. No, you say, most people most often land up doing things in this way. And there are three constraints to imagination, three broad types. And one is very general, and it has to do with living matter, and it has to do, he was talking of orchids, right? And, but it also has to do with non-living matter which is the way symmetry works, and the way human beings process the world through forms of broken symmetry. I'd love to speak to you about this, but I have no time, so I'll leave it at that. But then there are other things, like Alex was telling us, about us being prone to think about things as if they had skins as if they were contained and closed within themselves, just to do with our body. Or the proneness that we have to have abstract categories and treat them as if they were objects, as if they existed really. You can say this is a metaphor, but it isn't really a metaphor. It's the proneness that human beings have to thinking abstractly by granting existence, reifying, transforming into things, things that are not. And that's really what I wanted to talk to you about. And I'll, I will leave the rest.
for further discussion later. I wanted to give you an example of that. And when he said, you know, come bring a poem. I have written poems, but that's when I was madly in love and I was 16. My girlfriend says they weren't bad, but now she's 56, I can't really rely on her. Uh, it's, you know, she probably was as pleased by those poems as I was then, but they're not good poems. So I thought of bringing you a poem about Paris. You probably all know it, but I can't resist because it's a beautiful poem be for me because it's a poem that sits between two languages, French and English. It, it is a poem that exists in the two languages, and that's so rare. And in that way, you know, it really is a poem like me. I live between at least four languages, and I always have lived between those four languages. And it's somehow, I love people that live between languages, and I love poems that do. So the poem was written by this young man, who was an idealist, a pacifist, and when war came to Europe, he decided to be an ambulance driver. And he came from the America, he was a rich young man coming out of Harvard, and he came to America to drive ambulances. And he arrived here, and him and his friend started working in the ambulance service, and a few months later, the friend wrote a letter home saying, this war is mad. This is a mad thing that's happening here. This is a mad war. And the French authorities put them both into prison. And they put this poet into prison because when they asked him, but do you really hate the Germans? He said, no, I love the French. <laughs> no, j'aime les Français. And that was it. They put him in prison. Fortunately, his father was a very rich man and managed to get him out. And he could then write this poem about la guerre. Little ladies more than dead. That's the name of the poem. Little ladies, then dead, exactly dance in my head. Precisely dance, we danced la guerre. Mimi à la fois fragile qui chatouille des Italiens. The putain with her ivory throat. Marie-Louise l'Allemand. N'est-ce pas que je suis belle, chérie? Les Anglais même tous. Les Américains aussi. Bon dos, bon cul de Paris. Marie Vierge, prie pour nous. With the long lips of Lucienne, which dangled, the old man and the hot man se promène du small le soir. Ladies, accurately dead. Les Anglais sont gentils. Et les Américains aussi, ils paient bien les Américains. Dance exactly in my brain. Voulez-vous coucher avec moi? Non, pourquoi? Ladies, skillfully dead, precisely danced, where has danced la guerre. Je m'appelle Manon, sans rue Henri Meunier. Voulez-vous coucher avec moi? Ta vraie mimi, ta vraie minette. Dead exactly dance. Si vous voulez chatouiller le monde lézard, ladies, suddenly, je m'en fous des nègres. In the twilight of Paris, Marie-Louise, with queenly legs, sunk rue Henri Meunier, a little love bags. Mimi, with a body like une, joite, uh, une boîte à joujou, want my sleep. Toutes les petites femmes exactes qui dansent toujours in my head. Dis donc, Paris, ta gorge mystérieuse, pourquoi se promène-t-elle? Pourquoi éclate ta voix fragile couleur pivoine? With the long lips of Lucienne, which dangle, the old man and the hot man precisely dance in my head. Ladies, carefully dead. I love this. I love it because he, he's speaking in different languages, he's speaking in different voices, he is putting French women speaking in English. He is, he is bringing together. And what does he do essentially with this poem? Well, essentially, really, if you think about it, the poem uh, exists around a um, cheville ouvrière, a cheville ouvrière, a linchpin, which is the notion of dancing, which is the notion of movement. Now, the notion of movement, of dance, is an interesting notion because it's not any movement. What I'm doing here is not a dance, only metaphorically. I would, uh, I would dance if my movement was ordered. So these people are being ordered in a way, they have a music to which they dance. And that's who's driving that music? La guerre. And this is an example that I was telling you about. 
La guerre doesn't sleep. La guerre doesn't have a mother. La guerre doesn't drive cars. Where is la guerre? La guerre is an abstract concept, and yet it was killing the poilu. These were men that were coming out of the trenches to face the German guns with machine guns behind them. If they wanted to turn away, they would be raised, by, they would be either killed by the French or killed by the Germans. They had no option. They were dying in hordes. Go to the, school, to, to the uh, cloisters here and you will see hundreds and hundreds of, of names. There is no town in France, Portugal, England, or Spain which doesn't have a monument to all those thousands of people that were being slaughtered then. They were dancing, the dance, comme dance la guerre. They were doing it, but the women in Paris, the women in Paris were dancing la guerre in their hearts. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, you know, uh, they all are being moved by this guerre. They are moving, and it's so interesting, you know, cinq rue Henri Monnier, I thought, I'm gonna discover in Paris where cinq rue Henri Monnier, and I have to go there and leave a little rose, because really, I mean, doesn't there, there is no street à rue, rue Henri Monnier in Paris. You know, it doesn't exist, because in fact, Henri Monnier, as you all know, is the name of Cognac. He's in, saint carre exists inside the bottle. It's the, the address of saint carre is inside the bottle. And that's so fantastic. The same thing, the prostitute is called Manon. It's called Louise with queenly hair, uh, uh, queenly legs, like Marie, uh, 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 Louise, the queen. And Marie-Louise Lallemand, you know, uh, it, she, she is the product of some sort of German background, and she is dancing la guerre with everybody else and is breaking against her own sense of fraternity. Okay, I will stop. But I will stop by saying that if really I echo to this poem, it's because I think la guerre has not stopped. And we are dancing la guerre today. When the Prime Minister of England has came out a week ago speaking against, against European internal migrants like him, like me, like so many of us like him, we are dancing the dance of the guerre. There are people voting in Germany against people like me who had to move their country. Um, there are people voting in Rochester against him because he's Polish. Um, and you think, you know, that poor man in Rochester, not far from where I live in England, where, who is actually voting in order for England to get out of the European Union so that Polish migrants don't come to England. Um, really, is his condition going to get better? He, does he really believe he's going to be, stop being a member of an oppressed uh, lower class that is systematically unemployed and has been systematically unemployed in England for at least two generations. Does he really believe that? He's just dancing like air. He, his imagination is being, is being moved in ways that he didn't choose to go there. Somehow, he kind of just moved there. Other people are more responsible for making like air, but then they were also the people that invented the French machine guns behind Les Poilus, huh? so that they couldn't turn back when the Germans killed them. There were also such people then. So what I'm trying to say is La Guerre hasn't stopped. Marie-Louise Lallemand is still f fighting against her ancestors. We're all kind of in, in, in Europe dealing with a very serious problem of a metaphor that has taken over us. And that metaphor is the lack of fraternity, fraternity, the impossibility of understanding that Europeans are essentially, either they stand together or they fall apart. And, and, and that, that's the way we are today.
much for the invitation to Paris. I will talk a little bit about uh, metaphors and instead for some theoretical speech, we will present together with Alex uh, my book uh, Copenhagen. Uh, this book was published uh, last year, uh, translated to English. And this is my answer for those excerpts uh, from this book. This is my my private story about metaphors, about uh, metaphor of uh, our life on this planet. But uh, in the beginning, a little bit about uh, yeah, yes, my background and a short introduction to this book. And uh, well, I was born in '62 in Gdansk. This is not part of Poland, but grew up in Warsaw capital of Poland, and since 85, I have lived in Copenhagen, in Denmark. I came uh, to this city, Copenhagen. It's called Copenhagen in Polish language, therefore the title of my book, uh, Copenhagen, I have kept uh, uh, the same title uh, with my translator. And I came there in December 1995. And uh, <laughs> Copenhagen, has very special klima. And this is, I think this is a very important issue for this city uh, because uh, Copenhagen is in the ocean uh, climate zone and this is a kind of low, low pressure system from the Atlantic Ocean and the result is unstable condition through the year. And this is very important for human condition. Rain, stormy weather, etc. And the first version of this book was published in Poland uh, already in uh, 2000 in one alternative press uh, called uh, Kartki in Białystok town in East Poland. Then following Danish translation and in 2010 another version of this book was ready in my country in Poland. First one a year ago, English version was finished and then published uh, in the United States by uh, Zephyr Press, a publisher from Massachusetts. The book is uh, translated uh, by Piotr Piasta, a very, very interesting person, excellent poet, critic and uh, translator who living uh, in the United States. And he teaching uh, modern American poetry in the uh, University of Baltimore there. But uh, I think he's a uh, great, absolutely great poet too. And we have decided to call this uh, Copenhagen book for prose poems book. Uh, we have discussed this uh, issue many times uh, because you can find many different uh, artistic uh, techniques in, uh, in this book. You can find poetry, prose, uh, kind of mini essays, uh, dialogues here. So in the end, the best solution for us was uh, called this uh, book for prose poems. And uh, Copenhagen is absolutely an uh, anthropological book. Uh, the first person who discovered this ethnographical or anthropological uh, aspect or potential of uh, Copenhagen was a Polish critic and thinker Anna Kouża from University in Katowice. Then the great American Major Perloff has supported me a lot. But many of another Danish or Polish literary experts or critics trying, of course, to ignore this book, <laughs> Copenhagen. They don't like this kind of metaphor of our universal, yes, universal human condition. But uh, Copenhagen is not a geographical book. This is not a biography. And uh, this book is not a chronology. I, as I said in the beginning, uh, I came to Copenhagen in 95, in age of uh, 23. Uh, so in the beginning, everything was quite relatively new for me. New country, new town, very special, extraordinary language with his extreme difficult pronunciation, etc. It was not easy in the beginning. But uh, I have begin, I have started to write uh, 
Italia. And uh, everything was uh, interesting for me. I have observed details of this new space, then write about this. Some months, but after some months, years, uh, I have found that many things were similar uh, that Warsaw and Copenhagen are not so far away uh, from each other. Of course, Polish and Danish history, um, tradition or geography, this is quite another uh, issue, another story. But uh, after some uh, years in Copenhagen, I felt that uh, I'm really, that I'm really far away from Poland and far away from Denmark. I was uh, in this situation, I felt that I was only on planet Earth. And I, and that was this passenger syndrome, this passenger syndrome to be alone in this, on the Milky Way, to be this <laughs> citizen of the universe, rather than a member of Polish or, for example, Danish uh, society. But uh, back to Copenhagen book. This book is a kind of metaphor, a book of our dreams, of course, secrets, rituals, about modern society, people living in this big transnational city, who fighting for surviving, who dreaming about a God, of course, happiness, love, etc. And it was so easy to write, it was not so easy to write about this uh, very big complex issue. It's taken me many years to observe this special sounds from this, our planet. And uh, many phenomena was important for me, like, uh, for example, language, smells, food, architectural solutions, social and uh, politician nuances, relations, communication between young and old people, for example, health system assimilation of them who came, for example, from another country or religions. Then culture, of course, new and, uh, for example, traditional literary movements, poets, prosa and play writers, musicians of different kinds, jazz, rock, classic musicians. I have uh, collaborated with uh, them, many of them, many times, but this is, of course, another story. And don't forget, for example, visual art, film makers, painters, photographers. I'm also self a visual artist, so this is a, a quite popular issue in this book, Copenhagen. And uh, in the end, my resume or uh, my conclusion, yeah, it's very simple, because we are all human beings. If we have not a serious sickness, Take not hard uh, narcotics. Don't drink too much alcohol, for example. Then we can survive 75 or maybe 85 years. But if I only change this definition, the definition linguistically, we have only with 75 or 85 seasons to do. So 75 times spring, summer, the fall, or the winter. We are living in mortal bodies on our lonely planet. And the reason for Copenhagen book, for this uh, literary metaphor of our life, I know that uh, my vision is not very optimistic, uh, that this book is a kind of existential project. But the so called ambition was to send a kind of signal to another passengers of this planet to people who maybe feel the same and have a similar observation with me. As I said in an interview with Piotr Piazza, my translator to Jacket 2 American Magazine, I say to him that maybe what makes sense is, this, uh, is the possibility of, the, of human contact, kind of friendship, meeting of the minds perhaps through the literature. Through literature, you send signals to other people. 
maybe someone in the universe who feels the same way as you, they will recite them. This wouldn't be a victory, but at least it would give you the strange satisfaction that you are not alone. It's, that was a short introduction. Please, Alex, we can give you some I was just thinking. examples. Can you read, I mean, wouldn't you like much better? You can get naked and give it to me. a nice story about this kind of uh, technology, technological equipments. When I was um, a teenager, I was used to play with a punk rock band. The name was uh, Ska. In French, it's Le Pourri. Le Pourri. And then uh, everybody in the band were saying, um, do you have a jack? Do you have a jack? I need a jack. Do you have a jack? And I didn't know anything about music because I was a singer, a screamer, I was just screaming. And everybody was like, do you have a jack? And I was feeling completely outside from the circle because I didn't know what a jack was and I didn't have any jack. Then when I understood what a jack was, I bought myself a jack, but I mean, as a singer, you don't really use it. But I was always the first one to say, yes, I have a jack. So do you have a jack now? Uh, no, but I have a microphone. Okay, okay, that's good. You know. Okay, so we'll uh, read some examples from this book. I will do that in Polish and Alex uh, will do that in English. Coraz więcej bezdomnych wśród obcokrajowców żyjących w Danii. W domu opieki na Westerbro około 40% stanowią mężczyźni pochodzący z Afryki lub Azji. O Polakach się nie wspomina. Polacy się asymilują. Piją po godzinach pracy, oszczędzają, trzymają się powierzchni. Wracają na starość do kraju, gdzie inwestują w letnie domki nad morzem. Co stanie się ze mną? Kim będę za kilka lat? I czy w ogóle dożyję? More and more foreigners living in Denmark are homeless. At the public welfare office in Westerbro, about 40% are males coming from Africa or Asia. No one mentions the Poles. That's because Poles assimilate. They only drink after hours, save money, try to stay above board. When they reach old age, they return to their country and invest in summer cottages by the sea. And what about me? What will I be in a few years? Will I even be alive? Młoda, piękna kobieta na przystanku autobusowym. Wysportowane ciało, charyzmatyczne rysy twarzy. Patrząc na nią, nagle wyobrażam sobie, jak będzie wyglądać za 30-40 lat. Moja nieustanna, chora wyobraźnia. Wszędzie widzę węższe rozkład. Przypomina mi się genialna fotografia Roberta Franka. Fort Street, New York City, 48. Na zdjęciu pięć pulchniutkich. Wtedy taka moda kobiet. Zadowolone palą papierosy. Gorąca czekolada kosztuje 10, herbata 5, a cheeseburger 25 centów. Czy któraś z nich jeszcze żyje? Świat jest konkretny. Fotografie Roberta Franka zdobyły sobie zasłużone uznanie. Robert Frank is one of today's leading visual artists. I nigdzie ani słowa o tych pięciu gracjach. A young, beautiful woman at the bus stop. Athletic body, charismatic features. Watching her, I imagine how she will look in 30 or 40 years. My unstop unstoppable, sick imagination. Everywhere I look, I see decay. I am reminded of Robert Frank's brilliant photograph, 14th Street, New York City, 1948. Five plump as was fashionable in those times, woman. They are smoking cigarettes, looking content. Hot chocolate cost 10 cents, tea five, a cheeseburger 25. Are any of them still alive? The world is concrete. 
French photographs have gained a well-deserved recognition. Robert Frank is one of today's leading visual artists. And never a word about those five beauties. 37 lat. Żyłem wystarczająco długo i widziałem różne wzruszające sceny. Duńczycy mówią, że jestem dopiero w średnim wieku. W czasach wikingów uważaliby mnie za starca, za czarownika, za szamana. 37 years. I have lived long enough and have witnessed many moving scenes. Dates. Dates say that I'm only middle-aged. In the time of the Vikings, they would have considered me an elder, a magician, a shaman. Początkowe myśli, myśli poranne, żyje, więc muszę coś zjeść. Potem, czy komuś udało się w inny sposób? I znowu, muszę koniecznie coś zjeść. Kogoś, coś, przecież żyje, więc muszę koniecznie coś zjeść. To coś tego kogoś. First thoughts, morning thoughts. I'm alive. This means I have to eat something. Later, has anyone ever managed otherwise? Again, I really have to eat something. Someone, something. After all, I'm alive. This means I have to eat something. Something, someone. Jak bardzo musiałaś się rozczarować, biedna oso. Obleciałaś bezskutecznie całą kuchnię. Byłaś nawet w pokoju i łazience. A przecież w przygotowanym specjalnie na twój urodziny koszyku, w tym przy uchylonym oknie, czekały na ciebie gruszka, kiść, dojrzały winogron i pół jabłka. Czyżbyś wolała ode mnie hałaśliwego sprzedawcę włoskich lodów, który stale czyha na twoje krótkie życie? How disappointed you must be, my poor wasp. You circled in vain around my kitchen, even flew into the living room and the bathroom, never noticing the basket I had prepared especially for your visit next to the half-open window, with a pear, a bunch of ripe grapes, and half of an apple. Do you really prefer the loud Italian ice cream vendor and his constant attempts on your short life? Trzy wykłady profesora Abrahamowicza. Pierwszy z nich dotyczył zamków pod powierzchnią morza. Potem był prorok Emanuel Swedenborg, a teraz paranoja. Stosuje się również nazwę obłęd. Dowiedzieliśmy się zamiast niepotrzebnego wstępu. Charakterystyczne są dla niej przeróżne urojenia. Na przykład urojenia prześladowcze, reformatorskie, hipochondryczne. Zgoda, znamy to dobrze. Powstały też konflikty chorego z otoczeniem. To również brzmi swojsko. Natomiast, że paranoja rozpoczyna się przeważnie po 30 roku życia? Nieprawda. Ja miałem ją od urodzenia. Podobnie jak wszyscy inni ludzie, z którymi dane mi było się zetknąć. Abrahamowicz przyznaje mi w końcu rację. Wyraźnie lubi koncepcję osaczonego umysłu. Ziemia jest zamkniętym ośrodkiem dla paranoików, aby po śmierci wysłali mnie do innego. Rodzimy się i umieramy w paranoicznych ciałach, a nasze marne dusze podatne są na muszkatałową gałkę. Three lectures by Professor Abramovich. The first dealt with castles under the sea. The second with the prophet Emanuel Swedenborg. And now the third, paranoia. The term insanity is also used. We are told in lieu of an unnecessary preface. Paranoia is characterized by various delusions for example, the delusions of a persecutory, grandiose, somatic nature. Agree, we know those well. The patient is also likely to experience conflicts with the environment. This too sounds familiar. But to claim that paranoia usually begins after the age of 30? Not true. I myself had had it since birth. Just like any other person I have been destined to meet. 
Abramovich finally admits that I am right. He clearly likes the concept, the beleaguered mind. The earth is an enclosed compound for the paranoid. As long as I am sent to a different one after my death, we are born and we die inside our paranoid bodies, while our miserable souls are vulnerable to nothing. Co widział na niebie Klausen? Tego pewnie już nikt się nie dowie. Przyleciał podniecony z ogródka, gdzie pielił marchew i wskazując na chmury krzyknął tam, tam. Nalać ci drinka? Zapytałem go. A Klausen, kompletnie rozkarżony, powtarzał w kółko tam, tam. I na nic więcej nie reagował. Zabrali go potem do czubków. Jego meble poszły pod młotek. Co widział na niebie Klausa? Tego pewnie już nikt się nie dowie. What did Klausen see in the sky? Probably no one will ever know. He flew in all excited from the garden where he had been weeding carrots and pointing to the clouds exclaimed, There, there! I asked him, You need a drink? But Klausen, with a wild look in his eyes, just kept repeating, there, there. He wouldn't respond to anything. Later, he was taken to a lonely bin. His furniture ended up on the auction block. What did Clausen see in the sky? Probably no one will ever know. Czy gdziekolwiek indziej jest lepiej? Interesujące pytanie. Is it always better somewhere else? Interesting question. Freud obawiał się metafizyki i dlatego nie poszedł, nie cofnął się dalej. Jego ostatnią stacją były wspomnienia z życia wewnątrz macicznego. Całe szczęście. W ten sposób zostało nam coś na potem. Freud was afraid of metaphysics and thus did not proceed farther. His last stop was the memory of intrauterine life. Fortunately, this leaves us something for later. Dzisiejszy dialog w autobusie linii 350S. Ile lat liczy Ziemia? To zależy. Zależy od czego? Od Twego wieku. Today's conversation on the bus line 30, uh, 3350S. How old is the earth? It depends. Depends on what? On your age. Kaktusy. Wiedzą wszystko o naszych finansowych problemach. Znają na pamięć nasze kochanki. Rosną najszybciej, gdy nie ma nas w domu. Cactuses. They know all about our money problems. They know our ex-lovers by heart. They grow fastest when we are not home. Wraz z naszą śmiercią przestajemy mieć kaca, zepsuty samochód, niewierną żonę, alergię na księżyc, cholesterol, długi, hałaśliwych sąsiadów, zaniki pamięci, krótkie nogi, złośliwego spowiednika, etc., etc. Bądźmy więc dobrej myśli. The moment you die, You choose to have hangovers, a car that breaks down, an unfaithful wife, an allergy to the moon, bad cholesterol, debts, loud neighbors, memory loss, short legs, a malicious confessor, etc., etc. So let's be positive. Okay, and the last one is called 17 Days, and we will present this only in English by Alex. You want to do it? No, just do it. No, 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 but you want to do the last one? Yes, this okay. last one, yeah. Um, you don't want to read it in Polish first and in English, or...? Yeah, we can try, maybe. What do you think? <laughs> I don't know how much time we have. Because it's, it's a long time, so I don't know. Half an hour. Before two hours ends? Uh, so maybe we stop now.
Yes. Okay. And okay. we part to the sec we go to the second part. Yes, yes. Okay. And maybe on the second Same. part you, you can make okay. it. Okay. <laughs> like as if we continue a circle here. This would be very nice. Yes. That's good. Usually I think of this second part as a conversation between you after you, you just heard about the other propositions. Uh, if you have questions between you, you can go ahead. If the public has questions, you can ask questions. Otherwise I have plenty. Maybe, do you have questions? Huh. I am not there yet. Is anybody there yet? Okay, so maybe I start. Um, lately, I've been reading um, a book. Is, is, is it a book, can we? It's kind of a book of Joao de Pina Cabral. Yes. And in the certain moment, I will let you explain what this book is all about, but I'm very curious because many times in this book, you refer to the water as a mirror that reflects the sky. And you say this kind of metaphor or image many times during the book. And so I was thinking, that I had an intuition of what this image was about. And I was fighting between my intuition and the fact that I would admit you and ask you this question. Um, can you also explain a little bit the frame of the book? Yeah. This was an exercise I made in inverting the way uh, ethnographies are normally written. Normally, you know, and this has happened since they've started doing ethnographies. And by the way, they started doing ethnographies rather late, towards the end of the 19th century. Um, uh, and uh, when they started doing this, there was always some photograph, some hand drawings, but always some photographs, so that people believed. Because, I mean, ultimately, if you go and speak about the inhabitants of Adaman Islands or, or the New Air or the public that's reading this has difficulty in actually picturing what such, such a world might look like. And they put photographs or drawings to kind of convince you, to give you very similitude. And I was doing this work in a very, very beautiful air place, which is this vast, it's more than a, a, a thousand square kilometers. It's a forest in the sea. So these are trees that are growing in the sea. And they're an enormous forest in the sea, a mangrove. And there is these people in Brazil living in there. They go about in these beautiful canoes, which are made of one trunk. They are dug out canoes um, and the, of this yellow, beautiful wood. It's, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. A canoe lives longer than a fisherman. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it's, um, 
It's a very extraordinary thing. And I got up, I fell absolutely in love with the canoes, and then I fell in love with, with a, 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 a wood sculptor. Uh, we became really, me and his family, we became really dear friends. And my wife was coming along, and she was taking these photographs, and suddenly I realized that I could actually do it the other way around. I could do a book which were basically photographs where the text was just calling for verisimilitude. <laughs> so I tried to invert it. Instead of having a book of 400 pages with a little text, I had 400 photographs uh, uh, with a little photographs. I had 400 photographs with a little text. And that's basically what I did. So it's, it's, uh, 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 it's a CD-ROM, but you must read it because it has an argument. The photographs join together to make an argument and the words kind of just link up the photographs. And that's the idea. But when, what he, what Alex is referring to was not immediate to me, because I didn't immediately understand that when you are in a mangrove, the sea is, is constantly reflecting the sky. And the reason why it reflects the sky, it's because it's covered. <laughs> so if you go to an open sea, um, uh, uh, it doesn't reflect the sky. Well, it reflects the colors of the sky, but it doesn't reflect the sky. You don't see the clouds, the birds passing. You, you don't see that. But inside a mangrove, because there are these, this cover, the, the beams of light have to pass through small holes, and they form a mirror effect. And suddenly, you are, these people were navigating in a mirror. And what they saw in the mirror was that which they couldn't see. So they were actually fishing in a sea that was the sky. Because you can't see beyond the reflection of the, uh, 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 of the water. And that became, I didn't start by that, but that became a very important kind of structuring argument. As I started to understand, the way it kind of meant for these people um, an environment that fed them, and an environment that freed them from urban slavery. Because these are very poor uh, 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 Brazilians, and the alternative to going around fishing in these mangroves uh, is working like slaves in town. And this man, they knew eventually they had to go to town every now and then. They knew that. But as soon as they could, they'd come back and they'd spend some time fishing. And that was kind of a freedom. So there was this kind of odd sense in which this water was their freedom. And they knew this. They, 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 very, they, they talk of, uh, they, they talk of um, cachiveiro, as they say in Brazilian. Say cachiveiro, being a captive. And, and being free of being a captive by having this recourse, resource. Of course, they only have this resource because the Brazilian Navy owns the mangroves. So it's the state that owns that land. Otherwise, rich people would have taken it from them. But it's because it's state land they can afford to, be, to roam about. And, and so this, this notion of the water as, as a kind of a reflection of freedom became very important. And then, of course, finally, I'll, and I'll stop here, but I started entering into the way they, they see the world. They're very practical people, and they're very kind of hard-nosed, and they're not sort of very poetical on all that, or at least not immediately. But then when you start speaking to them, you start seeing these things emerging, and you start realizing that beneath this mirror, there is the land of Yemanja, the goddess of the water. And the goddess of the water is a mermaid, and she calls the fisherman. She actually puts her hand over the canoe and pulls the fisherman down, because she loves him, and he loves her. And there is this sense of, uh, 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 of this continuity. Of course, you know, I'm describing this, and if, uh, one, if my friend, M M Roman, the, the canoe man, if he was here, he'd say, that's rubbish, oh, she's never fished me down. And you know, he'd talk like that. But he knows what it is to be fished down by Yemen John. He's f fishing the fish, but soon the hand will come, I'll take him down. And, and that sense, and, and it's a gesture of love. 
So that sense of, of relationship became very important. And, and, and the way that kind of the goddess that is in a sense in the sky is in fact beneath the water. And, and, and she's, you know, they were painting the canoes um, uh, sort of baby blue because the baby blue is the, is, is the color of the goddess. Or they were painting it dark red with slashes of black. And that's the devil that, that kind of allows you to have access. Because in order to have access to the gods, you have to go past the devil. So what I'm trying to say is that in this kind of, in this kind of relationship between sky and earth, uh, sky and, uh, and water and, uh, and uh, humans and, 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 and uh, uh, spiritual beings, there was a kind of a whole environment of enchantment. And, and that enchantment, I'm telling you, if you go to Bahia, and if you go to Mojo de São Paulo, which many tourists do, you'll feel that enchantment. It's actually there, it's not invented, it's there. It's, there is this sense of this forest that is uh, in the sea, produces this kind of sense of enchantment. And that's what I tried to capture in this book. And in a way, you know, it reflects things that you were saying about Ke Copenhagen. from the book about the sky and the water as a mirror. I remember something about that. One of my poems when uh, uh, the sky is a system of uh, mirrors. But uh, they are uh, in a position uh, in that way that you cannot uh, see anything in, in them. When I uh, was listening to the uh, saying of uh, my colleague, I understood that uh, he is speaking through metaphors, that uh, every of his words is a uh, metaphor. Mm -hmm. The sky, the wood, the, sky, the, wood, uh, the water, uh, uh, the forest, uh, the uh, fisherman, uh, the fish. Only the, the sole naming of uh, the, the objects uh, is uh, poetry by uh, uh, itself often. Because a person uh, who knows uh, literature, it's enough for her to see a uh, fish in order to call uh, for a number of uh, visions and uh, evoke uh, lots of things. If we come back uh, to the, our subject of metaphor, uh, the fantastic of literature is uh, the fact that uh, you can, uh, for the language, to use it all. There is there is no uh, literary uh, language and uh, not literary language. Any word used uh, can be used in the text. It uh, can be uh, more poeticized or less poeticized, but uh, what uh, the colleague said, it was already a poem for me. <laughs> what is a poem? Then. Uh, in reality, a poem can be anything. <laughs> for me, uh, for instance, uh, some uh, Prim primitive uh, things like from the old times, uh, uh, primitive art, they can uh, have uh, more poetry than uh, uh, the academic uh, poetry or the later uh, technical, de technical developments. 
I understand it's not very correct to uh, compare uh, the two things uh, and that it has uh, no real sense. No, ale zgodzi mnie, że my na samym końcu do szumerskich pogodzi, a na pewno to ciekawie, że za góry, lesy, czy zachodu na pewno się to ma sama. But for me, uh, for instance, the Sumerian uh, creation is a creativity is more interesting that uh, when you uh, mention Hesse or Thomas Mann. This is, uh, but uh, this is uh, beside the fact that uh, I like very much uh, Hesse and uh, Thomas Mann. Because in the folklore, in ethnic things, uh, there is where uh, those metaphors were born. They are primitive there. Uh, they are uh, starting there. And uh, the, the, everything was developed from, uh, st from them. They were the beginning. We discussed uh, with uh, a woman friend of mine uh, about uh, the tales of uh, Crimean Tatars. It's a very, very interesting and uh, uh, little studied folklore. And uh, we uh, fall. Uh, Fell, we agreed uh, that uh, the majority of tales uh, of uh, the folklores in the world, they are uh, terrible, they are frightening. But uh, in fact, it's also poetry. <coughs> and uh, it's possible that there is more poetry there than in uh, later theological texts uh, are, which are less terrible. Rest less frightening. Yeah. Yes, and, uh, I will just add that uh, you could write, of course, we have to discuss this issue uh, yesterday. What is poetry? We uh, try to give an answer and kind of definition. But I think uh, we have a very interesting time now for, uh, for our activities uh, as uh, writers because uh, uh, we have a lot of possibilities now. Uh, poetry can be everything. For example, objectivistic poetry by, I can give you an example, by, for example, Charles Reznikov or sometimes William Carlos Williams, all those objectivistic super poems was also metaphoric uh, poems. So all, all those experiments with uh, computer uh, poetry, for example, with Clark or uh, conceptualist, this is also a kind of uh, metaphoric uh, system. And this is very, very, we can find uh, so many different interesting methods now. And of course, uh, also poetry who's connected to uh, economy, to social discoveries, to politics, is also a kind of metaphoric poetry. So this is good time for everybody and poetry can be a kind of uh, cosmic collage, you know. And <laughs> there is always future for poetry, I think. And all those, you know, collaborative project, you know, poetry with, this is very modern now, with this uh, collaboration project between uh, poetry and music, visual art, and uh, dialogues in uh, movies. And this is absolutely huge uh, district. <laughs> I think uh, that the possibility to uh, speak about things in uh, different uh, manners uh, were, was al always existing. We, we discussed with you uh, yesterday the development of the Polish uh, poetry after the war. because uh, it's associated to uh, Miloš and Herbert, uh, the after-war uh, poetry, first of all. It's uh, the philosophical uh, poetry which is uh, linked to the Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean uh, context. And 
but uh, there is uh, it exists a completely different uh, Polish uh, poetry which was existing and still exists. And I agree totally with that. Because I uh, was uh, speaking about uh, how can you write about war. For me, uh, there are, for instance, two uh, uh, ways in which uh, Polish poets wrote about uh, the uh, um, po uh, the Warsaw uprising. The first uh, variant was uh, Milos with his uh, voices of uh, poor people. Uh, it's, a, it's a biblical uh, way, uh, it's a totally European uh, style of uh, thinking. But uh, I got a book uh, which uh, is called uh, I was constructing barricades. I don't, I don't remember uh, the author, it was a woman who wrote the book in the 60s. And those are uh, short words of uh, direct action, which are um, without uh, metaphorism uh, as such. She uh, creates short stories uh, as illustrations for what we saw during the Warsaw Uprising. There is no philosopher, philosophy and uh, no uh, moralizing. Uh, the author is not uh, present in the, in the story, she is not there. Because of the schematism and uh, some way to see, uh, to show the things in black and white, uh, there is a big effect. It's again an illustration that uh, the same thing you can describe in uh, very various manners. Uh, the metaphor is uh, it's, uh, very convenient uh, for the author, but it's not uh, mandatory. Yes, yeah, what I think. <laughs> Just in the short answer, this is a very interesting issue, you know, metaphors, uh, if we talk uh, in context to uh, the war problems, for example. I have, uh, I have a lot of, you know, friends in Copenhagen, for example, who has uh, written about uh, the war in Iraq, for example. Jamal Juma is a great uh, writer from Iraq, you know, and his uh, uh, latest about this war was uh, absolutely fascinated for me. And then uh, if you talk about this uprising in the war, so, uh, so I think the best uh, text about this is right by Miron Białoszewski, for example. And this is, this is, yeah, yeah, this is absolutely the best. But uh, you have, you know, one year before uprising in uh, Warsaw, you had also uprising in Warsaw Ghetto, for example. So it was, you know, really good uh, text from Warsaw's Ghetto, writing about this uprising in Jewish language, you know. So uh, this is, of course, you know, many different ways to, to talk about this, you know, because uh, you have with uh, different views to do, you know, with emotions, with uh, calculations, with, uh, with poetry, you know. So, and this is not necessarily a metaphysical way to do, you know, because uh, if we talk about, for example, Mewars and another great big Polish poets, you know, a problem is not uh, metaphysical poetry, contra objectivistic poetry, but problem is how we do that, you know, and uh, because, you know, metaphysical poetry is very interesting, but if you uh, uh, can continue with some interesting uh, process, if you can talk uh, in an interesting way about those things, these issues. I would like to listen uh, Joao to, to this conversation also.
Mm -hmm. Is that something to say? Oh, no, you know, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know anything about, uh, about Polish poetry. Oh, uh, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so. so my comment is more general, and it's about this notion, this way of, uh, uh, you know, he was writing about the war, and then I was talking about the war, and the war also passes through your, your references. And, and what I think is, you know, when uh, he says that uh, poetry is everything, uh, that, all, all, that poetry is present in everywhere, yes, well, poetry is present everywhere, but there are some knives that cut better than other knives. In other words, you can have a knife that it doesn't really cut very well, and you can have a knife that cuts very well. And I think that it's the same with poetry. There are some people that are attuned to poetry, and they like a very well sharpened knife because they go around echoing things. I have friends that are like that. They, it's not that they're more erudite than other people, but they somehow are attuned, and, and, and poetry is part of their, of their existence. And it's not their poetry, but then it becomes their poetry because they can read it in their events around them. And I think it's that sense of, 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 of sharpening to the possibilities of poetry and, and experiencing it in the way you echo your world that, that really makes, uh, gives you a, a kind of a sharpened experience. And I believe there are people that have more sharpened experiences than others. And, and that is something that you can try and practice. I, I just like for a second to go back to this uh, word that we decided for today, which is metaphor. Yeah. I think in your presentation you said something interesting when you talked about associations and the way that thinking works with association. Which, uh, which in, in fact, I think that um, I do not want to do the same mistakes as yesterday in which each one remains in his own position, which mathematic is mathematic poetry is poetry, and a metaphor for a poet is something, and a metaphor for an anthropologist is another thing. I have a lot of respect for those who try to find the precision of the representation through words. Try to be more precise as possible. I have a lot of esteem with this. But still, when you say apprising, I have to hook to something when you say the word apprising. What is an uprising, see? So when you use that word, that word is talking about something else and my brain is making connections. So unfortunately, you're making a metaphor. Are you making one metaphor? Maybe more. Maybe ah, it's not even well, a that's metaphor. The it's a bound of meanings that comes and then I have to select. And of course, maybe we can connect to the idea of imagination. Now, what do I select about which chair is what? Beautiful talk also about the chair. It's nice. But I, the other thing that I wanted to say now that we are talking maybe about also process of associations or, or then process of thoughts is this chair, I would like to remain to the idea of the chair. I'm simple, I like a metaphor, a very simple object, the images. If we get stuck to the idea of the chair, that chair is under certain laws that are physical laws. It exists in physical laws. This chair, those many chairs, do they exist? And if they exist, they exist under which kind of laws? Those, they can, do they can move things? You, were said, you said before, Laguerre can move things. It's an entity that can move things. How can I, uh, one idea or this flickering concept, or if you want to call it a character, or you said entity, how does it move things? To which laws? It is uh, inscribed in which rules. Yeah, you see, that, that is the complexity of the issue. And, uh, and it is complex. It, 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 there is no easy way out of it. Because, you know, if it is a generally complex issue, it, it, there's no way of simplifying it. It'll have to be complex in order for it to remain so. Uh, and, uh, you know, now let's invent a chair by Marguerite, 
which is a chair that you look at, it only has one leg, but it stands straight. He's organized some strings, but you don't see the strings, but you, should, but you recognize it's a chair, right? But a chair with only one leg is not really a chair. So you're extending it. Um, uh, uh, you, you're manipulating, you, 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 you're actually giving Marguerite the charity of understanding that that's a chair. So you think, okay, so I have this image of what a chair is. Even if it, half of the image is gone, I can still recognize a chair. But what is the nature of this image? Ultimately, and that's where the complexity arrives, ultimately, it's in gesture. And that's really where we find it so difficult because we've been trained from Plato to think of pictures in the head. But you know, it's a very, we should, we should know that we can't think about it in, the, in this way because if I have a picture in my head, who is seeing that picture? <laughs> and then who is seeing the picture of the guy who's seeing the picture? And who's, uh, it's, it's the parable of the homunculus as they call it. But, but it is a problem. Is it, who is seeing this picture? Ultimately, nobody is seeing this picture. Somebody has a whole, a whole history of, of being in the world, of experiencing, and is recreating it. So we're making films to ourselves, as it were. Um, uh, you see, and that's really the beautiful uh, thing. But then you ask, what is La Guerre? Where is Laguerre? Okay, so now we've agreed that there are no pictures in the head. We've agreed that we have experienced things, and out of those experiences, we produce this kind of uh, uh, this kind of fiction for ourselves that we recognize uh, an entity that we call Laguerre. The problem is that I actually believe Laguerre exists. <laughs> I actually I believe in Laguerre, and I believe in Laguerre because. You know, it's, it's what I was telling you about the traffic in the city. You know, the traffic could go through all the streets, but it lands up going through two or three streets. So, traffic exists. <laughs> uh, do you see what I mean? It, there is such thing as going more through these streets than going through all streets at the same time. And, and, and that means it's the same with these abstract entities that we recognize we actually collectively create phenomena that then act upon us. And that's the, the way Laguerre, it's a metaphor, but it's a metaphor that acts upon us. I don't like to call it metaphor. I will, I will go through the public because yes. we don't have that much time. But you can reply to questions and also address to, to what we have said. Uh, you, just the microphone, yes. Uh, I would like to hear more about what you said about the limits of the imagination. But if it's possible, we can, you can pick like two mov movements, very typical mov movements, in the modern art to go, to don't go far, um, more far. So like, for example, the surrealism. And uh, let's take another one like uh, Cubism or any other that you want. Then how we can uh, talk about, if we can talk about different levels of limitations of the imagination or how you could extend more your argument what you say categorically that the imagination is limited. Also, the limits between those who are more habituated to create, to think, to imagine, to, uh, let's say, train in the brain in that sense, and others that are not. Mm. Please. Mm. Well, you know, you gave really two interesting examples, surrealism and cubism. But they're interesting examples because they're examples of movements of art that are very easily recognizable, and that you would have thought that they existed as unique phenomena, and there's a way in which they do, but they both are actually sapping onto ways of imagining that have been there all the time. And I mean, that's very much the case with Cubism, which is inspired by primitive art, by African art, art very particularly. And so we're actually dealing with, with just, you know, um, they develop the technique a bit further 
they just took it a bit further. But the, the, the proneness to go that way um, uh, uh, was, was there already. And the same thing with Surrealism. You know, you read Levi Strauss on, uh, on Les Mythologiques, and he, he, I mean, much of that stuff is fairly surreal. It's surreal in the way that then they picked in order to develop their way of thinking. They went further, but, but the, the trend was there. I really do believe that there isn't all that much thing. There, is, there aren't really all that many new things under the sky, as the Ecclesiastes says. And that ultimately, we're kind of moving in, 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 in ways that are not ultimately, that are not so difficult to, rec to recognize. And that's why I get very angry with my colleagues that call themselves ontologists. <coughs> and who say that between culture A and culture B, it's incommensurable. And I say they're, they're just being stupid. <laughs> they're just being excessive. They're just doing a kind of a, a theatrical gesture. Because if that was the case, then how do they know? They wouldn't have known. Because they wouldn't have been able to do ethnography. So ultimately, I go to, uh, to, to a new environment. I get a, a, a real big culture clash. But I have the human instruments to enter into it. And that to finish, and that's why it's a limitation, but it's a limitation that gives us power to overcome it. And it's like, you know, the thing I was saying about the chair. The idea comes out of this philosopher called Kwai. And what he's saying is that ultimately nobody understands anybody else completely. But that's not a sign for us to be depressed. It's the contrary. It's a sign for understanding that we can only understand because we don't completely. Because if we understood completely, we wouldn't have understood. There would, there would have been no way uh, of actually representing something in two minds that is equal because such a thing doesn't exist. Couldn't exist in physical terms. And so the only way we can understand is by not understanding completely. And it's, the same, it's this notion of limits is that notion. Is that it's a notion that you, you, it's because you are in a way limited that you can develop surrealism, for example. That is uh, sorry, but I have to interrupt because we are running uh, out of time. I'm sorry, just two hours. I would like to. St we can continue. There is some champagne. Maybe they will Great. give us uh, ten minutes for champagne. I don't know. <laughs> but I would like. Uh, I will. I will love this conversation to be not endless. At least the other two hours would be nice. Uh, thank you so much for coming, all of you, and then also you, uh, Nikita, all of you. Huh? And just uh, to just to finish, just one simple uh, poem that maybe has nothing to do with this night. Maybe nothing. Just I would like to finish with this single line: "Is Bill not?" It's an American poem. There's Outside the snow is falling into its past. Thank you so much for coming. And